Welcome to my top 10 most compelling costumes for Game of Thrones, this one for Season 7, Episode 6, Beyond the Wall. I'll be doing my final recap of Episode 7 after the season finale next week, so if you are new to my channel, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And I have a bunch of things to cover this episode, so you might find it a little bit longer than my regular recap videos. Before we get to the countdown, I have a bunch of artwork that I want to share with everyone. Not only are you the smartest audience, but you are also one of the most talented too, and I really appreciate you sharing all of your gorgeous work with me. Here are more costume designs from viewer Tatiana Melendez. She always blows me away with her use of symbolism in the costumes. These two are of the Lady of Winterfell, Sansa Stark, as you might be able to tell and she's deviated away from Michelle Clapton's dark palette and incorporated the mauve from earlier seasons, something that Tatiana says always looked good on her. Pictured on the left is Tatiana's redesign of Lady Tarly's costume, which I appreciate because as many of you know, I hated her costumes. This is lovely. And last but not least, this showstopper, Alaria Sand costume in emerald green on the right. I will leave a brief description of each costume in the description below in case you want to know more. Next up are these two amazing quarter scale doll repaint reproductions by Lisa Ram Sammy of The Doll Place. The one on the left is Danny's Karth look and on the right is her marine look. This dress is what she wore in the fighting pits of Astapor and it was one of my favorites of Danny's many costumes because of its simplicity. The next one is my absolute favorite of The Night's King, and I'm actually going to get into this costume in this episode. And of course, he is the ultimate baddie who our hero Jon Snow is trying to defeat. Here's Jon's Night Watch all black costume from earlier seasons. And if you want to know more about her fabulous dolls, you can find Lisa on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll leave the links in the description below. Susan Hook at My Immortal sent me these awesome repainted quarter scale doll reproductions. Here's Jon Snow, I think it's his King of the North look, and I'll leave her Twitter and website in the link description below. She also did this one of Jon's Lady Love Egret. But the one that blew me over was this award winning doll, one of Jamie in his Kingsguard uniform. The detail in the armor is incredible. Susan has so many dolls to look at that you can find on her website and you can also find her on Twitter. Cashy Pan on Twitter, her handle is at Yukata Sukata, which I think might mean my house is your house in Japanese. She's a home sewer and also an avid knitter and an amazing illustrator. So she shared with me these, this darling illustration of Marjorie and Sansa from season three, although Sansa's gown has weirwood tree leaves. And warning, I want to give you guys a heads up on this episode that I'll be covering real fur and leather products to some extent. So if you find this subject matter upsetting, please don't watch this video. And I don't want to delve into a debate about it. I'm just laying out the information and then you guys can just decide for yourselves. As usual, there will be spoilers in this episode for everything that's happened so far in the show. And more importantly, the new season of Game of Thrones. So come back and watch this after you've seen Season 7, Episode 6. I have a lot to cover in this episode, so let's get to it. Storyline aside, I really love Arya's costume this season. Costume designer Michelle Clapton has used separates for Arya in the same way she switches out Tyrion's sleeves and jerkin to show a change in time. HBO also released some great pictures so we can get a better look at her costume. So it's basically the same one that we've seen except that they've swapped out her leather jerkin for this beautiful blue-gray quilted fabric. I want to point out that the quilting would provide no real protection unlike a gambeson or a buff coat. But as a trained assassin, Arya has done all of her training and fighting without one bit of armor so it's likely she won't start wearing it now. Here's a close-up look at the machine embroidery that creates a triglyph or Y-shaped motif. The grommets are metal, as we've seen in the majority of Game of Thrones costumes. Now, from a historical standpoint, lace eyelets would have all been hand-sewn, usually with a bound buttonhole stitch, as metal grommets weren't introduced until the 19th century. Here, Arya wears her leather jerkin, and as you can see, the top of the sleeves are bound with matching leather and then attached under the cuffs of the jerkin vest. 
As I've mentioned before, and as other viewers have noticed, Arya's square pattern on her coat is reminiscent of her father Ned Stark's costume, namely his gambeson, which he wore as a protective undergarment. YouTube viewer Althea pointed out to me that Arya's square motif is reflective of the House of Black and White, which was the temple in Bravos dedicated to the many-faced god. And you can see on the doors behind her the square pattern that looks similar to the one on her cape. Viewer Lovey Dovey also mentioned that it looks like the squares that hold the faces in the Hall of Faces. The woven pattern on Arya's cape really looks like the doors of the House of Black and White. I wanted to share one more viewer contribution. Nina H sent me a message informing me that the textile used for Arya's cape isn't knit like I thought, but it might actually be a woven fabric. Nina is a knitter, but more importantly, she has a degree in textile design, so I'm happy to be able to share her observations with you, including these images she shared with me. So she says, and I'm quoting her here, to be more precise, it looks like a waffle weave where you achieve the long floats which create the grid-like pattern. It's been probably done very loosely and in a nice thick yarn. I think you can achieve the effect of the grid being so pronounced with a knit very easily. So thanks again to Althea, Lovey Dovey, and Nina who contributed to the discussion. HBO released No Professional Stills of Poor Thoros of Mir, which should have been an early warning that he wasn't going to make it out of this episode of Live. I've placed Thoro low on my list because as far as warmth goes, his clothing feels the most ill-conceived, and I don't mean by the wardrobe department, but by the character himself. I've had to make a lot of assumptions this season about where the clothes come from and who makes them and so on. So what I imagined happened here is that Torment took everyone to a room and offered this motley crew a selection of wildling clothing to choose from. As you can see here, Thoros is really only wearing a woolen blanket over his clothes, kind of like a belted serape or a poncho. And you can see that there are some skins under it as well, but under that is his cloth gambeson, which would be very cold in the northern climate. This will not bode well for Thoros, along with the fact that he is drinking, which most outdoorsmen know will speed up the hyperthermia process. My impression of Jorah, compared to all the others excluding Thoros, is that his costume appears to be the least warm of them all. It's like they all drew straws and this is what he ended up with. Or he's been living in Esso so long he had no idea what was in store for him. I'm not certain that his costume is an animal skin, it's awfully hard to tell. It could actually be wax cotton canvas for all I know. I live in southern Canada and our winter, especially without a hat, he would not make it a day outside without having severe hyperthermia and frostbite, let alone 24 hours stranded on a rock surrounded by an army of the dead. He does have little bits of fur sticking out that could be the lining of his coat, like how Clapton made the wilding costumes fur side in. Here are some great examples of the type of fur that Clapton might have used. These two are both faux fur and they're both from Etsy. So the one on the left is a curly faux Mongolian sheepskin and the one on the right is a faux Mongolian sheepskin long hair. The one thing I really do enjoy are these very thick stitches on the seams. In the medieval period, this type of stitch would have been used to attach the pieces of fabric together, especially leather where there was an even clean edge in the same way a surgeon uses sutures to sew skin together. Sorry if that's gross. This is most likely decorative, the seam sewn using modern methods with a sewing machine. Here's an example of the whip stitch, although this one is a, on a bit of an angle, but you get the idea. In case you're wondering what this is, it's a medieval backpack with straps fashioned out of scraps. I suspect it might have been designed after a surveyor satchel. Gendry is the only one wearing a hood. I always think it's so funny when you see Game of Thrones principal characters without hats and hoods, but we can't blame the wardrobe department for this, however. It's usually the DOP, or director of photography, who insists that the actors go hatless. Clapton has said in interviews that she fights this, but as we know, loses when all is said and done. 
His costume is a sort of mishmash of the other costumes, a variety of skins, and you might also notice that next to his warhammer, he has a dragon glass dagger in his belt. Looking at the hound's costume, I can't believe that his outfit would be made from anything other than real animal skins because it looks so real. Michelle Clapton said in an interview back a few seasons ago, we made all the costumes for the North from skins. For research, we looked at the Inuit and at Tibetan tribes. We try and look at peoples in different times in history to see how they would have dressed in that environment. It's possible that these are made from upcycled wildland clothes. This particular pattern looks like a patchwork of seal skin. Here are a few examples of clothing worn by Arctic nomadic people. Pictured on the left is a Nenet Siberian man from a tribe of Siberian reindeer hunters. And on the right is an Inuit caribou fur parka from 1900 to 1918 from the central Arctic. It's on display at the McCord Museum in Montreal, Canada. And because the temperatures in these climates can drop to minus 50 degrees Celsius, they must wear hoods in these, in these harsh climates. Here's another example. Pictured here is a man of the Sami people, a group of indigenous people living north of the Arctic Circle in Satmi or Lapland as it is known in English. Here's a few examples of seal skin and what it looks like. On the left are harp seal skins and on the right are ring seal skins. And I thought I'd mention that Canadian seals cannot be exported to the US and Mexico because of a ban on seal products, but the UK doesn't have such a ban. Here's an example of a parka made from commercially tanned seal skin that is trimmed with wolverine from 1961 by the Holman Co-op in the Northwest Territories. It's on display at the Northern Heritage Center in Yellowknife. And seal was used by indigenous people for clothing because the skin is naturally waterproof. Herman's costume hasn't really changed from what I can tell, so he's pretty much worn the same thing all season. Here's a shot of him with his lady love, Brienne, in Winterfell. Tormund has a lot going on here. There's multiple layers of skins with some woolly furs and long hair sheepskin mixed in. And the skins are waxed, which would give an additional protection because it would essentially make his clothing waterproof. And like many of the wildling, he has a full length beard, which would give him some protection from the elements. He's wearing a rope on his costume and a very rough cloth satchel to carry his supplies. And it also looks like fur scraps have been used to patch holes up as they arise. Eric's costume is one of my favorites in the episode. It's very modeled with all of these patches, which is the natural pattern of the skin. Again, it's possible that it's seal skin, but another popular animal skin used by northern indigenous people is reindeer. The coat is made from multiple layers, although it is structured very much like a coat. Here's an example of a child's Inuit parka made of reindeer calfskin sewn with sinew and trimmed with wolverine fur from 1939. Here's an actual Scandinavian reindeer hide from Finland. In this close-up, you can see this hand-sewn detail on the collar. And like all the men, Beric wears these boot covers drawn at the top to keep out the snow. Here is a boot with a similar design. Amazingly, this boot dates back to 480 BC. This sealskin boot or kamek is one of the oldest examples of footwear found in the Canadian Arctic. I haven't touched on the Night King's costume in any of my videos yet, so I thought it was time that I addressed the elephant in the room. Of the Night King, Dan Weiss says, We wanted to kind of evolve the White Walker look. He is of a group of almost ageless creatures, and we went back and forth for a long time until we hit upon something that was, if anything, moving in a more human direction while maintaining a generally horrific look. David Benioff said, It's an interesting mix between something frightening, obviously, but also regal, something aristocratic about him. We wanted a distinction from the other White Walkers that we've seen. This look was also a change in direction from earlier on in the series. Here's a shot of a White Walker from season one. 
According to visual effects supervisor Rainer Gombas of Pixamondo, the company that's responsible for Game of Thrones special effects, he said in an interview, the producers and creatives were not happy with the White Walker costumes from season one. They wanted to redesign the look. So pictured here is the revised White Walker costume from season two. You might have noticed that the Night's King looks different, and you wouldn't be wrong. The Night's King was played by Welsh actor Richard Brake. But now the Night's King is played by stuntman Vladimir Furtick. Apparently, the non-speaking role was recast with Furtick, who's a regular stuntman on Game of Thrones, because of all the physical requirements of the character. You might also remember Furtick from the scene in which Leaf, one of the children of the forest, turns a man into a White Walker. Costume designer Michelle Clapton said in a past interview that the White Walker costumes are part of sculptures and architectures that they were used as armor. The idea was that they may be discovered in ancient society that was actually very sophisticated, but the leather bits were all kind of eaten away that wouldn't have survived. But this of course falls apart given that there is a certain uniformity in the White Walker's costumes and that many of the pieces are fastened with leather straps. Here is Michelle Clapton's original concept art for the White Walkers. Here's a behind the scenes shot of the Night's King and White Walkers. Michelle Clapton says of the major shift in season four, David and Dan said that now the White Walkers know they're in danger, that there is obviously something that can kill them, that they should be armored. I went back to Samurai a little bit. I looked at the way they tied things and put things together. I also looked at Egyptian. It has these sort of sh very sharp cutout pieces. It's almost like a fender, like a car fender. It's quite unusual, I think. You can see in this screen grab that the metal armor is punctured with holes, creating a sort of cheese grater style texture. The construction of the armor is made of a series of chevrons. In heraldry, the chevron is an inverted V that represents the roof of the house, derived from the French word chevron, meaning rafter. Among the Celts, the shape acted as the mark of a warrior or hunter or someone in the community who was a builder. I got this from a guy named Vet Dude on Reddit, so take it with a grain of salt, but he says, the chevron came to be used in various forms as an emblem of rank for knights and men-at-arms in feudal days. One legend is that the chevron was awarded to a knight to show he had taken part in capturing a castle, town, or other building, of which the chevron resembled the roofs. It is believed from this resulted its use as an insignia of grade by the military. The chevron is also the same shape as the Greek lambda, which was first adopted in the 1420s BC by the Spartans and quickly became a widely known Spartan symbol as seen on their shields. Here's another behind the scenes shot of the Knight's King costume and you can see here that the armor has a samurai lamellar style armor. The tab that hangs in front of the skirt is distinctly Egyptian. Here's an example of a Japanese chest armor piece from the Edo period, which is between 1603 and 1868. This lamellar style armor is constructed with over 500 individual small lacquered scales that are made from leather. And here's an example of Japanese iron plate shoulder protectors similar to the ones worn by the Knights King and the White Walkers. Pictured here is an Egyptian warrior riding a chariot and notice the gold breastplate and the tab in the front of his linen skirt like that of the Knights King. I think that the White Walker armor is also similar to the sparring armor of the Night's Watch, which also is very Japanese in design. One of the most questioned embellishments is this little metal detail on the Night's King breastplate. You'll see slight variations of it on other White Walkers as well. When I first saw it, I thought it looked a little bit like a typical needle threader that you might find in a sewing kit. Another YouTuber, and I'm sorry I can't remember who, thought that the symbol looks like the face of the three-eyed raven. So let me know what you think in the comments below. I've left Jon Snow next to last because I thought of all seven characters, he looks the most appropriately dressed for the excursion. He's learned a thing or two from his free folk friends, including Tormund. He's not wearing a hat, but as I mentioned, this was for technical reasons not, and not a design decision. 
He's removed the wolf pelt from his cloak and added it to his wilding attire, although for some reason the wardrobe broke down the leather straps, adding this sort of white spray to it. And under his pelt, he wears another layer of sheep-like skin. And one thing I'm not sure of is this little ball here. I think it might be some sort of toggle to keep his collar closed. If you look closely, you'll see that John's outfit is made of wide strips of fur that have been stitched together to create this patchwork effect. And the skins, again, you know, they might be seal, but I'm not quite sure. For additional warmth, it also appears that John's costume is lined with a fox-type fur. You can see that John's pants are put together the same way as Jorah's coat with widely spaced stitches. And he also has the same Kamek style boots as Barrack and the other boys. Here's a good shot of his sleeves made from various colors of the skin. He's wearing his belt that holds his sword long claw, but also a pickaxe that would have been handy to pull himself out of the water. You can see the similarities between the King of the North, Jon Snow, and the former King Beyond the Wall, Mance Raider. His costume is also made with strips of skin, although he wears it free folk style with the fur side in. Before I get to Danny's new costume, I wanted to mention that Michelle Clapton has launched a set of solid sterling silver jewelry, including Danny's Mother of Dragons chain of intent. It's being sold through her MEY Game of Thrones collection. And you might recall that Clapton collaborated last year with jewelry designers Eunice and Eliza to bring to the public Danny's dragon neck sculptures. And as I mentioned in a previous video, it was also certain that Clapton had teamed up with Eunice and Eliza to create Danny's signature jewelry piece. And in fact, this season, it's the only piece of new jewelry that she's worn. Clapton says this about Danny's chain. We felt that because this is now her military campaign, she needed a weighty symbolic piece of jewelry that showed her strength and intent. This design informed the choice to wear the chain across her chest. It becomes less like jewelry and more appropriately militaristic. It was important to use the three dragon sigil in the design of the chain and also the circle at the shoulder in which to loop her red Targaryen sash to heighten her sense of status. According to designers Eunice and Eliza, they say each link was originally hand carved in wax using fine carving tools and hot pens. We wear special magnifying glasses to create detail when we are sculpting. We made each link as a whole piece first and then removed sections to create a skeletal feel. The links represent a fragmented and skeletal dragon spine. And I'll leave a link in the description below in case you want to check out the entire collection. A few weeks ago on Twitter, I posted this outfit asking, why aren't we getting something like this for Danny while she flies Drogon? Well, ask and ye shall receive a snow white coat befitting a queen. As usual for HBO, they haven't released any high res images of yet for Danny's outfit. So obviously trying to keep spoilers to a bare minimum, but of course that was all futile given the link. So. What I can ascertain from the screen grab is that it is real fur and I suspect it's either rabbit or white fox. I originally thought it was narrow strips of fur side in so that the taupey gray color we see is the skin side up. But after trying to zoom in, I think it is actually fur side up and that the stripes and zigzags are created with top stitching or maybe even embroidery. So if you look closely, you will also see that the underside of the sleeves is made from a matching suede. Here's an example of Arctic white fox skins from Nunavut territory. Of course, a really fantastic feature is the contrasting fur strip down her back, almost skeletal-like, that creates a sort of built-in superhero style cape, because that's what she is really in a sense, right? Rescuing the boys after they ventured out above the wall with an ill-conceived Tyrion style plan. Now, despite all of this decoration, this coat is cut exactly the same way as her costume from episode 5. The texture of the cape also reminds me of the texture of Drogon's spine. The contrasting fur of Danny's costume looks like this red fox fur. If you look at the back, you'll see that this contrasting back panel follows the same lines as her gray costume from the episode Eastwatch. Like this coat, we also see the zigzag pattern on Danny's gray episode 5 coat. The zigzag pattern is a series of chevrons and inverted chevrons. The zigzag is depicted in ancient symbolism such as hieroglyphics. So for instance, in hieroglyphics, the letter N means water, as we see on the left, 
and the astrological symbol of Aquarius, the water bearer, is also represented by two rows of zigzags. So now, of course, with Danny being a Targaryen, she's a dragon, which in Chinese astrology is actually a fire sign. So there must be some other reason for the pattern. Putting my tinfoil hat on for a moment, both the Knights King and Tyrion have chevrons incorporated into their clothing, although Tyrion's is an inverted chevron or, you know, an upside down chevron. If you really want to read something into this, I suppose you could glean that the Knight's King is a warrior in a path of ultimate destruction, while Tyrion is a more diplomatic person in his determination to achieve Danny's goals through negotiation, even though it doesn't always work. So perhaps Danny's zigzag is a combination of the two, both warrior and negotiator. Now I realize that for anyone who might want to undertake Danny's costume for cosplay, you will have your work cut out for you. But might I suggest that these two faux fur fabrics be used as a shortcut. The cream herringbone groove faux fur on the left already has a zigzag pattern and it also comes in silver if you prefer. While the platinum faux fur forest fox fur on the right would make a suitable cape. And both of these textiles can be found at Mood Fabrics, so I'll leave a link in the description below along with all of the other fabrics that I recommended in the video. That's it for this video. What did you think of the list? Did I miss any of your favorites? If so, feel free to leave it in the comments below. I'll be back with my final Game of Thrones recap next week. Thank you so much for watching.